Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Do you have an app idea that you've been dreaming about but don't know how to actually start building it? Use Bubble. I've been using Bubble for a number of years now. It's an extremely powerful, no-code platform that enables you to build, launch, and scale real products without investing thousands of dollars on engineers, designers, or spending time trying to code it yourself. Use Bubble's visual drag-and-drop tool to create really anything from marketplaces, SaaS products, and so much more. Join over 2 million people, including myself, already using Bubble to launch and grow businesses. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Harzad Rashidi. He's the lead innovator at Respana. Harzad, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you guys are doing at Respana is really innovative and cool and i think a lot of people don't understand how important and useful what respondent does can be for their company but maybe before we get into all that let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up sure so i'm actually originally iranian and oh, i cool. lived there actually i was born and raised till i was a, a teenager and i moved here um, um when i was in high school age Got it. Okay. So you went to university. What did you take and why? I did business administration. So it was kind of a, um, well, I was originally a biology major and then and okay. my, growing up, my parents always said, Hey, you're smart. You gotta be a, you gotta be a doctor. That's like a stereotypical, like Persian parents <laughs> kind of like ingraining us in the brain. They'd like, sure. you've got to become a doctor. And I, to be honest, just didn't like it. I mean, I was doing well, um, uh, academically, but it's just, I could never see myself looking at that, uh, looking at medicine as a career. I mean, it's a very respectable job and I sure. and I always, you know, have high regard for doctors, just not something that I wanted to do. Um, so I got involved with, uh, you know, I was always in tech and, you know, I, I, I was uh, kind of doing some electrical engineering programming growing up, you know, in middle school, high school age and went to some competitions. So I always had a passion for technology. Uh, but I didn't, again, wanted to want to do that as a career per se. I wanted to kind of have a little bit, um, a, have a broader perspective uh, okay. and, and build a tech startup or company. And that was always really my goal um, and be tech savvy enough to understand, uh, to hire people that are smarter than me to actually put the building blocks together. Right. Um and so I started uh, actually interning at a, at a company called Vizme at the time. It was a very tiny startup when I was in college. And, and, and that sort of led me to become their first marketing hire at uh, a school and, and basically got promoted director of marketing. And, you know, we, Vizme was a widely successful, well, it is a widely successful startup that got over 18 million active users. We're getting close to about 4 million in monthly organic traffic, over a hundred team members. Wow. So that was basically uh, the, the journey there. So got quite lucky there to kind of get involved with the right team at the right time. Very cool. Okay. So you were there for a while. What made you actually decide and uh, start doing respond on? So it is interesting. So I, when I joined Visme, we were bootstrap. Well, we are still to this day a bootstrap company. So we never raised any outside funding. And okay. as you know, in the software space, it's quite difficult to compete with Very folks hard. that you know are going to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. So my job was basically to build a customer acquisition strategy. It's not to just okay. get a few customers here and there, but to basically build a pipeline of evergreen flow of customers. <laughs> so. Sure. Um, there was a few channels traditionally where basically a lot of software companies acquire their customers. One, uh, the first thing is the problem that popped into mind is 
cold average, right? So going door to door, start selling. And the problem with that, it works very well. The units, uh, the, uh, the economics of it works only if you're selling a product that is of high LTVs as in right. numerical values, right? So basically, if you're selling an expensive product, then it makes sense to hire US based SDRs and AEs, right? To do, you know, cold, do cold outbound outreach and kind of do demos and onboardings and contracts and whatnot. And, and Visme as a product was a very, well, it is a very affordable software. I think at the time it was like $15 a month. Oh, now it's like yeah. starting like 20 something dollars a month. So it just does never make sense for us to do. Outbound, I mean, obviously nowadays uh, we're, we're experimenting with it for some of the enterprise customers. But again, this is, at the time was not something that was worth the effort um, outside of, you know, just getting user feedback and, and, and just proof of concept. Another channel is paid advertising. And as anybody who's ever tapped into paid advertising, everything looks great on surface, right? So you're like, great, I can just go and target my ideal customers and pay a few dollars. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. get a conversion. And it just doesn't work that way when you do it. It's funny uh, in real life. Um, don't want to dive too deep into this, but basically what I found with paid ads is that there is some diminishing return over time when it comes to um, uh, debt return on investment. So basically, to put it simply, if you double your conversions, you, uh, excuse me, if you double your budget, you normally don't get double the conversions. So at some point, your LTV, uh, which is your lifetime value of customer, catches up with their cost of a acquisition or CAC um, very rapidly. And, and then anything above that, even if you just increase the budget, you're just going to take a loss on conversions. So at some point, you're going to tap those out. And, and we still do some paid ads up to this day, you know, some retargeting campaigns and whatnot, but it's very minuscule compared to our size just simply because they use a bidding system. And what happens is that over time, the cost of acquisition and cost per clicks rise rapidly. Like it's been tripled over the past two, three years. So it wasn't really a reliable channel. Also, as a bootstrap company, we didn't have the cash to pour it all into paid ads, right? Got it. Uh, I still had to meet payroll and <laughs> you know, R&D and all sorts of things. So what we basically ended up doing was understanding where our customers were and started showing up in places where they were looking for us instead of us having to go and like push ourselves in front of them right or chase after every customer so so can i interrupt you there when yeah go how, ahead how did you do that or figure that out because that's really challenging it seems it sounds so simple but it's right. really difficult exactly so here's exactly what we did so kevin you are a potential customer for visme right sure so let's say you are looking to create a an infographic for this podcast and you want to publish it somewhere. Okay. And you you like to look for a solution that helps you do it. What's the first thing you do to find a solution? Google. What do you Google? Uh, I guess it depends, but for the most part, you'd just ask for like you know, templated graphic or podcast templated graphic or something mm -hmm. like that. There yeah. you go. So you just answered your own question. So we knew that, that basically, okay, our customers, it's the type of product that you normally Google to find. Right. right. So it was a matter of figuring out, okay, what are they Googling and how do we get ourselves up there? Because normally you, when you Google a term, there's a bunch of ads at the top. We normally skip those, <laughs> right? And you yeah. go through the organic search results, find a couple of products, take a look at the landing page and you sign up, right? Um, and so that customer journey or that buyer journey for us was kind of pretty much clear from, from at, at the very beginning of the creation of the company. Uh, and again, this is not to say this is the right channel for everybody, right? So that's why I kind of went through the exercise with you because one, you are aware of the problem you're solving and two, you're looking for it on Google. And those yeah. are really two key questions to ask before starting investing in SEO because for example, one of my friends is a, is a director of marketing at a medical device company. Okay. And, and, and then she asked me, she was like, so far as I was really want to invest in our SEO this year. And so what do you recommend would you recommend us to do? And I was like, okay, uh, what's the average deal size? They're like, well, about a hundred K plus. Mm -hmm. And I was like, who do you sell to? They're like, well, our like hospitals normally and like other facilities. And I'm like, are these people Googling? 
to find a solution to, to buy a hundred thousand dollar, like for example, MRI machine. And they're like, no, I'm like, then why are you looking to invest in SEO? You got to go where your customers are hanging out. Maybe the right yeah. channel for you guys is to go on events, conferences, maybe is to go hire salespeople, go door to door, right? If you sell, for example, t-shirts and shirts, any sort of lifestyle product, right? Nobody's going to Google to find a hoodie, right? You got to yeah. go to retail stores and try to get your, or, or do e-commerce, maybe Facebook ads or hire some TikTok influencers. I don't know. Just go where your cu customers are hanging out. So the type of product you sell is going to determine what channel is going to work for you. It just so happened that the type of product that we sell at Visme uh, was, a, was a prime candidate uh, for SEO as the main customer acquisition strategy. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Interesting. Okay. So how did that lead into Respona? So what happened was that it, uh, it's a lot easier said than done uh, getting ourselves up in the search results. So <laughs> you know, <laughs> sure, Kevin, yep. can you do this for me? Sure. Just one of our main keywords, for example, is presentation software, right? Okay. So if you sure. go on Google right now, just open a little incognito tab and, okay. and then, okay. yeah, so your existing okay. search. Yeah. And then just go ahead and look up a keyword like presentation software. There. Of course, I can never type when people are watching or listening. <laughs> but, okay, it's up. No. Okay, so you see how right underneath the search bar, it tells you how many web results like it found, like yeah. about how many search results are there? How many zeros do you see? Uh, what, three, six, nine, nine zeros? That's right. So one billion <laughs> search results. <laughs> Over right. a billion. It's just, yeah, That's right. a billion, yeah. 20, <laughs> 20. Billion and 70 million, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyway, so... You see some ads at the top, so skip those. What do you see like in the organic search results that you actually would click on? The first one is uh, visme.co 15 best presentation softwares for 2023. Full comparison guide and then Zapier. There you go. Yeah. So, so let's think about this for a second logistically, all right? So let's say out of this bit one billion, we all know most websites aren't good right so yep. <laughs> like let's say if you did your best create the fastest prettiest uh, most user-friendly website that's in the top one percent right i guess we can all agree at top one percent of websites it's, it's pretty damn good right uh, yep. when, when there are a billion search results you're competing with top one percent is nothing you're selling them tens of millions right yeah yeah um so Basically, what we had to figure out was to understand, okay, so these are our target keywords. And again, by the way, I don't recommend folks to go after the parent keywords from day one. So normally, there's a state, it's like a different phases of building authority for your website over time. Like you normally start with less competitive, more long tail versions of your keywords, and you kind of work your way up from there. But just to kind of stick to the principles, we don't want to dive too deep into the topic. But we had to figure out how Google works as a search engine. And, and and that algorithm basically determines what we need to do in order to come across as an authoritative resource. And 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 I can dig a little deeper, but I want to pause really quick just to give you a chance to to uh, see if you, how deep you want me to get into this. No, I think keep going. This is good. Okay. So the year was 1990. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's awesome. go back to the 90s. Uh, so. You know, Kevin, you're a young guy, so you probably don't remember. Well, I'm 40, uh, when... but yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember. Hey, 40 is young. 40 is young. Um, anyway, so back in the late 90s, like Google wasn't the the king of search engines. At 100%. The yeah. There was, you know, AOL and Yahoo and Bing and there's a bunch of other ones. So that didn't have majority market share. And what they come up with, so what, what happened at the time, the search engines, the way they work was basically all based on the content on the web page. So you go and look up a phrase or a keyword and then go look at their index and see, okay, what other web pages have this keyword in there that is most likely caters to this intent. And then we just show this website. And since marketers ruin everything, uh, people would just <laughs> stuff keywords on their web page, right? So just do shady stuff. So they just repeat the same keyword like 10,000 times. <laughs> and then the search yeah. engines would. So what happened is that the quality of search was quite low. Yeah. So what Google did, they're like, okay, so let's introduce a new variable. So instead of just relying on on-page metrics, which is, you know, how good is your website or how good is your content? And now recently, how 
fast it loads and how whether it's responsive, all that stuff. Aside from that, because th those are all under your control and anybody can do it. Let's also add a popularity metric. So for your website, we can see how popular Kevin is. And if other relevant authoritative resources in your niche, in your space are talking about you and referencing you, then we put a lot more weight on this website to get up in the search results. So that include uh, that basically was the backstory of creating the uh, creating this algorithm called PageRank at the time, uh, which I thought it was because you rank different web pages. That's what they call a page rank. But it's actually because Larry Page, the founder of Google, actually invented this. That's why they call it page rank. Just fun fact. But anyway, awesome. so, yep. Keep so going. that radically improved the Google search results quality. And that's why everyone started using Google as their main search engine, just because they could get their answers quickest, fastest, and from authoritative sites. And that's where sort of the concept of backlinks came to be, is that basically, it's just saying how popular you're kind of like a mean girl's popularity contest. The more relevant authoritative sources are linking to you and talking about you and these hyperlinks that you see across the web, it, it's kind of a vote to popularity. And that sends a signal to Google and now all the other search engines really that, hey, these must be an authoritative website and resource because other people are talking about it. And, and that sort of a gener uh, kind of was, was kind of the backstory there. Very cool. Okay. So what made you build software around this? All right. So at Visme, what I did, basically, we were like, okay, we know where our customers are hanging out. We know that they're Googling terms like these. And let's go just build a bunch of pages that caters to the search intent, right? So we want to build a bunch of landing pages and blog posts. And we were so excited to launch this like after a few months of writing and, and, and we put it up there and guess what happened? Nothing happened. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like that's a, that's crazy. a normal startup response. That's yes. right. <laughs> Everybody thinks a million people are going to come day one. Yeah, we we showed up when I, we we woke up in the morning. We're like, where are all these people? And so anyway, so it was just two people visiting the website, and there was one of them was me, and the other one my mom. And yeah, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> like, okay, we built all these pages, but none of them are getting ranking. They're just buried in the search results. So sure. what we soon figured out is that, okay, we need to start reaching out to other websites in our space and collaborate with them and incentivize them to actually start talking about us. And what happened over time when we started investing in that effort um, significantly is started trickling in a lot of mentions. And now, you know, a big part of it actually happens organically. So we still do quite a lot of outreach, but that kind of starts that, uh, you know, that snowball effect basically where it's very difficult at the beginning but then it gets easier over time of getting other people to talk about you and and basically link back to your website and that in and out of itself was basically um the the process that helped viz me now get over close to about four million monthly organic visitors now just to kind of put some dollar amounts behind it let's say kevin if i were to bring in the same level of traffic same keywords right through Google ads instead of our organic results. How much would you think we would have to pay Google on a monthly basis? Throw a number. Probably like tens of thousands of dollars, potentially. Tens of thousands. It would be around $1.7 million a month. Each oh, month. wow. Okay. Yeah. So paid advertising. Out. Right. Because the cost yeah. per clicks of the keywords, some of them are like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. So basically, now that effort is generating as $1.7 million a month worth of free advertising, right? Right, yeah, <laughs> okay. interesting. And, and along with, you know, obviously a myriad of other benefits like brand awareness, and all that good stuff. But basically that effort was sort of, again, was a lot easier said than done because we were like, okay, we need to reach out to the websites. What do we say to them? Who do we reach out to, right? right. Who's the right person? How do we contact them? So. The concept again sounds easy on paper. When you actually start doing it, you fig you soon realize that this is a very time-consuming, excruciatingly difficult process. So, oh yeah, what we yeah. were doing at the time was just to basically duct tape a bunch of different tools, and what a lot of companies still do is like manually kind of doing things together. And there's a couple of tools out there, some legacy tools, and they're either like spam software. <laughs> On the on one end of the spectrum, or they're just a manual CRM. So there, there wasn't really a software that would help us kind of keep a sense of scale, right? But at the same time, be personalized because at the end of the day, we're in the 
business of building relationships, right? So right. Um, that uh, whole process was sort of done staggered across, scattered across like a bunch of different tools. So what we did was to put together the whole process under one roof. We kind of duct taped together a, a, a internal software really to kind of help our team be more efficient and streamline the whole process from start to finish, from researching the type of website to finding the right person, to getting the contacts, to sending them connection requests and, and outreach them on email, yada, 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 keep track of them. And that basically was that baby, the baby alpha version of Respond that was created internally and it just worked ridiculously well. <laughs> and like it, oh, yeah. awesome. I can't quantify this, but like it literally 10x our productivity. So we're like, wow. okay, guys, we've got something here. So we decided to release it as a standalone product. And that's sort of how Respond was born as a separate product out of Bizme. Got it. Okay. So you obviously, the company's been around a number of years now. What what did it kind of, or how has it evolved to what it is today? And then let's cover some use cases of how to use the tool today. Because I, I think even just the four you have on your, your main website are, are interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so the, so you know, as any entrepreneur, we, we made a lot of mistakes at the beginning. Like one of the sure. first things we did was this very unclear messaging. Like, yeah, it's hard. That's so yeah. hard. Yeah. So like people land on a website, they're like, what the heck is this? Like, I literally, I remember like the first website we put together was like, uh, it's like, don't spam, build relationships. Like that was like the title. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? Like now looking back, it just sounds like stupid. Like it just <laughs> so obvious, like in retrospect, but at the time we didn't really know like whether or not this was a big enough market. We didn't know who else we could help. And what we soon realized, well, not soon, obviously it took us months, but sure. um, yeah, yeah. now in retrospect, looking back, um, we, we figured there's mainly two types of, I uh, would say, businesses that benefit from our software a lot. One are other SaaS companies that rely on content marketing to bring in traffic and signups, right? Um, and two are marketing agencies, SEO agencies that basically offer this as a service to other clients. So the, their clients could be e-commerce, SaaS, right? Or even non, like some more traditional businesses like, you know, mom and pop shops and smaller businesses. Um, but those normally aren't as successful running these outreach campaigns because they're normally not as tech savvy per se. I don't want to disrespect anyone, but normally that's kind of the pattern that we've seen is that software companies do really well internally. Uh, but for other types of companies, normally it's best if they hire an agency to let them do it. And those agencies are normally our customers. Got it. Okay. No, that makes sense. So can you maybe give us some use cases? Um, like how, maybe let's just go out, go off the four you have on your homepage. Like walk us through some link building, podcast discovery, press inquiries, and affiliate recruitment. Because I think sure. that covers the gamut of probably at least one of those or a few of those will hit with with the listeners so do you maybe want to start with link building sure I guess it's hard to talk visual on on audio only things so <laughs> right no worries i'm used to it i've been sure. doing these interviews for quite some time and uh, i'll do my best to make sure i paint a good picture i'm also gonna direct folks so we actually have as you mentioned on our website respona.com r-e-s-p-o-n-a.com it the bottom of the page is something called an average strategy hub and it basically is a step-by-step -step instructions to all the different link building average strategies that I'm going to talk about a couple of today. Uh, but but if you guys want a resource that actually is visual and actually shows you, it's on gated. It's you can it's free, so you can just go open it up and literally start implementing them manually. You don't even need Respondent for most of them. Like you can just do it yourself manually, right? It's just going to take take a little bit more time. And whenever you're ready to scale things and you're actually ready to kind of take it to the next level, then obviously Respond would be a, a, a platform that helps you do it. Um, but but let's talk a little bit about a, a few practical examples, right, that folks can actually implement. So yeah. one of the simplest one I like to start with is what I'm doing right now, which is going on other people's podcasts as a guest. Sure, so right. that cool. obviously, this is not to say that's the only reason why I'm here, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> so, well, no, like I totally get it. Like we're, it's beneficial for both of us, right? Exactly. And that's the whole point of doing all of these outreach tactics. It's not to just take something from other people, it's to create mutually beneficial relationships, right? So exactly. 
so there's a mirror to benefit on going as a on on going as on podcast as a guest. One, I'm helping you create an episode, right? So I'm, yeah. I'm basically cre- helping you create a piece of content for you, and 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 so that what well, I'm spending an hour of my time, right, going and and doing that for you. So that's here's what's in it for you. What's in it for me is a few things. One, I'm getting to meet smart people like yourself, right? So Kevin's my buddy now, right? We're now connected on LinkedIn and we chat over email, right? And yeah. Uh, and, and that relationship means a lot in the long run uh, when you meet other fellow like-minded people right in your space. Two, obviously, it's free advertising to a niche audience. So anybody who's listening to the show right now has heard of Respana, right? Has heard of me. Uh, and, and even though if you don't just go and sign up for Respana right away, at least you, whenever you come across it down the line, you've heard of us. And that brand awareness is something that companies have to spend millions of dollars, right? Um, 100%, yeah. To, to just get their brand name out there. And three is also, you know, helpful because whenever you dissect probably, you know, transcribe this episode or normally podcasters have some sort of website that they put the episodes on. And yeah. guess what? You're going to have to mention Respondent somewhere. <laughs> so yeah. yep. that in and out of itself is a backlink to mention. That also helps increase our domain authority and, and be able to get our web pages up in the search rankings because... Google and other search engines are like, okay, if Kevin is referencing Respondent, they must be legit. So, you know, that basically helps also getting our website up in the search ranks as well. Makes total sense. So how do I use Respondent to actually do some of this link building outside of maybe like doing a podcast, for example? Sure. So actually, that's how uh, our team landed this interview. So what they do is that oh, they interesting. fire up Respondent. Yeah, so what they did, basically, they fired up Respondent and uh, basically, Respana, we have a template for podcast hours. So they'll basically ask you to, um, so it literally has a step-by-step. So he's like, okay, name someone in your industry they respect. So it could be another founder, it could be another competitor. And then basically just write a little bit of bio and question. And what it does is that it will go and find all the podcast episodes that that person has been a guest on. That automatically tells you three things about those podcasts. One. They accept guests, <laughs> right? Because not all podcasts do. Wait, do. sorry, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. So wait, so you searched for somebody like a a guest, and you don't have to tell me who it was, but like somebody that's well known that's been on other podcasts. Is that what I heard? Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I okay. can actually pull up. So if you go and look up the conversation history you have with our team, I can. I, I'm I'm looking at this out right now. There we go. So okay, now I'm fascinated our, by this. Yeah, so our team member, let me see, was it Vlad or Yvonne? Uh, Ooh, that's, I'd see. have to look at my email as well. I'm looking at this. Vlad, all right. Okay. Shout out to Vlad for booking this interview. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so what he did, he's like, hi, Kevin, just finished listening to your interview with Tammy McQuinn. And oh, I, yeah, okay. That person is actually. And, and I love the tip about personalization at scale, yada, yada, yada. And I'm wondering if you're open to be introduced uh, to someone I know in the SaaS space. Yada, yada, yada. So, okay, wait, sorry. Can I ask a couple of questions about this email then? Go ahead. So, did Vlad have to listen to some of the interview? Because if he's pulling no. a tip out, where's that coming from? That's that coming from, from Respana. So, here's what we do. So, interesting. Yeah. So, what Respana does, first of all, when you feed it a person of interest or a niche or target keyword, it goes and finds all the interviews for you and goes and finds the contact information of the right person at the podcast. And what it does, it pulls the that either if you found that episode or if you've found the podcast and will pull the latest five episodes of the podcast and gives you the show notes uh, of that podcast. So you can actually click through and also see the transcript and you can easily personalize it outside of just the variables, right? So the emails are genuine emails. They are not like just mass and emails that, that I'm sure you get every day, right? So that process is just streamlined so that it takes very little time for right. him to, you know, listen to part of the podcast, maybe even, you know, take some notes from the episode and show notes and transcript and, and personalize the sentence um, so that it comes across as not doesn't come across as spammy. It comes across as saying, hey, Kevin, I actually did some research. You know, I'm not just reaching out to every single podcast that's out there. And we're not right. There's some criteria has to be met, like the podcast has to be a popular show, which your show is in the top 10 percent globally. I'm not sure whether you know this, actually. 
but you have a very popular show. So great job on that, Kevin. All right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure it's been a lot of work. And also, um, you know, there's some criteria that has to be met. So that whole process, though, Responder walks you through it. So it's kind of hard to mess it up. So that's one of the things is that a lot of people go about these type of average tactics, trying to do it manually and just miss a few steps because it just takes so much time. But when Responder just puts it in front of you, it's just very easy to, to get it done correctly. So you're not just spamming people but you still maintain a level of scale. Yeah, interesting. Because you're right. Like now I remember the email now that I'm looking at it, right? Like I get, like you said, I get a ton of these. But the interesting thing, and I, I want to cover this because I think it's very important because your competitors, I, in my experience, don't do this personalization. And you could correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, but you probably say like that's why you built the product. Right. Um, yeah, like so, yes, you definitely like your first line is, well, I don't need to read it, but I'll just summarize it. It's basically like, yeah, that you listened to her episode. You you mentioned something that was clearly in the episode because I remember the episode because mm -hmm. we did it in person. So it's interesting because like it was like this is episode number 66 and I'm in 500 and some, right? So for me to remember an episode I did probably five plus years ago with somebody, but the fact that it was done in person and I remember us talking about what you put in the email, which is interesting to me because a lot of people don't, it's not that personal, right? And then um, it, you also mentioned that you you put it uh, like in your, you're going to put it in the newsletter, your newsletter, which mm -hmm. is like pr cross promotion for me, which That's is right. obviously important, right? Um, and then you also took that personalization information into like an internal newsletter, which is interesting. People don't, or, or sorry, with your team. And then you're basically asking like, oh, can you introduce me to like you, which is mm -hmm. fine. Like obviously you, there's a call to action, which is makes sense. And then whether it's true or not is like been a long time listener of the show. Right. Which is interesting because it's like, well, if you've, if you're back that old of a episode, the chances of that statement being true right. is potentially high. Right. Because because of your first opening comment of like here's a tip that i actually found useful i shared it with the team and you know they're gonna put it in their next newsletter like that's right it, it, it's like very personalized even though it and i wouldn't have guessed when i got that email that it was generated by a piece of software right that's and it actually literally tip. says sent by respana at the end of it if you if you take a look at it because that's something oh. that we do intentionally you don't our customers actually, don't have to put it in there let me see uh the bottom of the signature is says sent by respond but anyway we, we have that okay, so that right. you yeah, know yeah. that we okay. are using our own software to actually do this type of outreach and the goal was never to be deceptive kevin and you no know fair. i don't want you to ever feel like Right. So this is basically something that does require some research. And we don't reach, reach out to a whole lot, actually. I think it's like five yeah. to 10 podcasts every week. And uh, and we normally get a booked interview that one a week. And that's the extent of what I can do with my time, right? It's, it's not so yeah. much that uh, we don't want to. It's just that there's some time restricts there. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that this is something that is a lot of entrepreneurs. We've got an interesting story. Um, yeah. This is very effective when it comes to getting things rolling and other strategies like uh, again don't want to be too hung up on the podcast there's tons of other things you could do for example one of the simplest strategies that i recommend folks to get started with especially when it comes to either e-commerce or SaaS, is is a listicle strategy right so right. figuring out okay what are some of the articles or blog posts that people have written on for example best presentation tools they right. haven't mentioned us, but they've mentioned a compete, uh, competing product or service or uh, or best CBD gummies or yada, yada, yada. So you get the idea. And basically, uh, reach out to those bloggers, find who's the in charge. So that's, again, part of what Responda does is finding the correct person on autopilot and getting the contact info. That took us like two years to build. Uh, but oh, anyway. yeah, I can imagine. Because doing like if if you had to do this manually with the web and or LinkedIn, this takes like... I don't really want to necessarily go back to the podcasting thing, but to to find five shows that you want to be on that are relevant to you and the guest is going to be take you an astronomical amount of time, right? And That's so right. it's the same with doing PR or trying to get whatever. 
you right. can do all this stuff manually. It's just, it takes you so much time as somebody exactly. that's used tools and done it manually. Trust me, you want to use a tool. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't want to you know plug our tool too much here. It's just to come across as like a salesperson, but I'm, I'm mean, just saying that we don't ever do any magic. Like I always say, even to our customers, I'm like, you can do what our software does manually. We just do it like a hundred X faster. So you can, yeah. maintain a level of scale, experiment with different strategies, with different messaging without having to sync like six hours a day. You can do it in six minutes, right? But, but I actually think that's a very good startup founder. Well, at any, or busy person, it doesn't matter. Or like, if you can automate something, and I get that you're not 100% automated and you can still personalize it. So I don't mm -hmm. mean it like that. But if I'm a big believer in spending a little bit of money to save a ton of time, because right. if you, if you save, take six hours and I'm not kidding, six hours to six minutes to your example, well, that's a huge time savings and, and the dollar amount you pay for, you know, respond is nothing. Right. Right. Yes. I mean, we we're like starting 99 bucks a month yeah. building monthly. So, so yes, I mean, it's supposed to be a no brainer, but you'd be surprised how many people ask for a discount. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I mean, we say no, but the thing mm -hmm. is, you know, sometimes we have this, uh, stigma around paying for software or tools. Like we, like you go to the grocery store and you buy like a pack of, like a bag of groceries and cost 120 bucks. I mean, I, at least yeah. in DC, that's, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And and so yes. And then you're like, all right, you're going to save a full working day every week at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. So, yeah. But I mean, what, that's why like we found like a lot of software companies, agencies, like these guys value their time like 100%. crazy. And so, uh, software that can help them save this amount of time is, is, is a no-brainer for them. So that's kind of why we picked our ICP to be those two. It's not to say that other types of companies, like if you if you own a blog or if you have a some sort of publication, can use our platform. We have quite a few folks who use it for that purpose. But we found that like if you run a software company, you probably have a million other things on your plate. So you don't want to just have like a team of people managing this uh, and cutting that head count down at least is, is just a no brainer for the software tools. Sure. The other thing that I want to cover um, too is you actually help people like find the person's email address as mm -hmm. well, which can be time consuming. Right. Yes. So that was actually one of the things that I had to come up with um, at the very beginning of Respana, the creation of right. our platform, just because we had a team of six full time staff members. Okay. whose entire job was just to find contacts using tools, yep. like not manually. Like we had a, like three or four different software tools like Hunter.io and LinkedIn Sales Navigator and right. all sorts of things and just to make it work the way we wanted it because there's no other software that was built for this type of average. Like there's a lot of sales tools, right? So you can yeah. pull up, follow and say, okay, give me all the marketing managers in DC in SaaS and they'll give you like a list of, gazillion people right yeah or zoom info these type tools that they, they're just built for sales people and now on the other hand are tools that are built for finding contacts but they're predominantly like generic contact information like web scrapers like they give you like support at xyz.com and then good luck trying to get a response from these so there's not a software that would, that would go and do research to find the right person for the websites that you want to reach out to and get the contacts so it's kind of like a reverse sales really because yeah. uh, you start with a, a website and kind of and then also there's a lot more things involved with that like with podcasts like normally you want to look at the rss feed and like with different websites you want to also look at the contacts page and sometimes you want to go on look at linkedin and there's like 24 different data providers that respond is plugged into so all of that had to be done manually so that basically we brought it under automation. So right now when you load it up with a bunch of websites and that the respondent helps you find, uh, then you just click find contacts. <laughs> and then it's an automation that runs in the background. It normally takes a minute or so for each uh, um, content piece or each is opportunity as we call it. And it will go and find the right person, gets the contact and verifies that contact information in real time, finds the social profiles, to complement and 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 then puts you that gives you all the results. So you basically don't have to do anything. The reason why even that takes that long is that the machine is kind of putting all that stuff together.
Interesting. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And as somebody that's done that stuff manually, it's, yeah, it, you're just saving a ton of time, right? Right. I, I totally, yeah, it's, it's totally meets a need. I, I'm also curious, and maybe what, what other ways can people use Respondent to promote their company, startup, business, et cetera, other than maybe the four we covered? Right. So see, funny enough, Kevin, I'm surprised of some ways that people find use cases for Respond. Okay. It's like, this, so the tech, the tech stack we built basically helps you go from websites to contacts. Right. So, so you load it up with any website in the world, it will go find the right person, get the contact information, and then you can uh, reach out to them with a personalized email and LinkedIn and automate automated follow-ups and then we have some CRM and stuff built uh, on top of it. So that's the, that's all we do. <laughs> right. Yeah. But then the use cases for this is endless, right? Now sure. you can reach out to podcasts. You can reach out to blogs. We have people recruit affiliate partners, right? So let's say you start an affiliate program. How do you get people to actually sure. promote you? Right. So, okay, let's go find, uh, who's already an affiliate of a comp competing or another product in our space, right? That's already successful, gets a lot of traffic. So let's reach out to them, invite them to join our affiliate program. Okay. Uh, some people use it even for sales, right? So we ourselves are dabbling into outbound and okay, we have a list of um, marketing agencies um, that potentially could use Responda. Let Responda go find the right person to reach out to, right? Um, I, there, there, again, there's quite a few different things you can do with a platform that is outside of the scope of link building per se, but that's, uh, that's the main use case that a lot of our customers are using it for. But normally once they get into the tool and get access to this uh, power, I would say, um, they, they also find different ways in how you use it. So they, they kind of have different types of use cases. So we don't have a customer just using it for one particular pur uh, purpose. Got it. Interesting. So you've been at this a long time. What advice would you give maybe your younger self or people listening that you wish you knew maybe earlier? About the business or in general? In general or both. So I'm, I mean, I guess it, it's just my own maturity. Um, when I started in the business, I was quite young and um, I, I tend to be very impatient at times okay. and I'm getting better yeah. over time as I'm getting older and getting a little more mature, <laughs> sure. um, you know, good things take time. That's what my co-founder says, who's been in the business for 20 plus years. And that's just something to keep in mind. You know, a lot of people get so excited when it comes to, you know, the idea of a response sounds great on paper, right? So but the, it's just so many uncertainties and like so many problems or hurdles that there's no way you can foresee that happens along the way. And the only way you can get through this is by being patient and, and persistent, right? Yeah. Showing up every day and, and do the work it needs to get done, even though it sucks and it feels like you're not moving. But these incremental changes and showing up every day, now three years passed and you got a you know solid product, you got a solid customer acquisition strategy built, you got an evergreen flow of customers. So it's like going through that hurdle is most that's where most people kind of give up uh, on because uh, there's so many reasons to give up and and then you just kind of have to push it aside and 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 push through and and figure out things as you go it's kind of like driving a car as you're changing the wheels right <laughs> it's kind of yeah. the best um, I, I didn't come up with this I, somebody said that and i was like that 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 resonates with me so <laughs> no i i think that's that's really good advice the other thing is I, I want to cover this as well. You guys are actually hiring and tech's all kind of doom and gloom right now. Um, mm -hmm. Do you maybe want to mention what types of people you're looking for? Because I, I know a lot of people are looking right now. But yeah, so we're we're actually actively hiring for our main role right now that we focus on is a, a software engineers. Uh, okay. So on front end, uh, maybe back end, uh, we always need some help building. We have a long list of new features <laughs> on our roadmap and our backlog. So anyone uh, we can help to help us get it done. We normally tend to work with folks that are like senior engineers, just because we're a small team, we just don't have the capacity to train Got a it. junior staff member to, to start. But yeah, any, any senior engineers uh, who are interested, I'd love to hear from you. And React, right? React front end, yes. Yeah. That's, that's the main stack, right? Yeah, fair enough. Um, we're kind of coming to the end of the show, but is there anything else you want to close with? And then we'll mention 
where people can get more information about Respondent? Uh, well, just one thing uh, um, that I see a lot of companies kind of sort of miss, and again, I'm guilty of that myself, is not to have the the shiny object syndrome is that anytime you see a new technology or anytime you see a new uh, strategy or tactic or hack, you jump on it yeah. without thinking of good advice, long term opportunity cost, right? Of letting go of stuff, doing stuff that's working, and kind of jumping on different things and kind of spread yourself thin. And and so I would say whenever you find a channel that works ignore all the other channel that don't and kind of double down on stuff that works already. And that's what I found to be the most effective way of doing things when it comes to all aspects of the business. Well, I think that's really good advice, but we're out of time. So how about we close the show with mentioning Mark, where people can get more information about yourself, respond on any other links you want to mention? Sure thing. So yes, respond on.com. That's that's, we've got a lot of free educational content out there. So Definitely check us out. But myself personally, my name is Farzad Rashidi. Aren't a whole lot of us out there. So I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> easy to spot normally on LinkedIn. That's my main channel. So feel free to stop by and say hi. And I'd love to hear from folks. Perfect, Farzad. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Kevin. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. And keep building the future.